Hello everyone, thank you for coming to my talk. My name is Yu Sun Lin. I am currently a uh, research scientist at Visa Research based in Palo Alto. Today I would like to talk to you about a joint work with my advisor Wang Chen Li from Penn State University and Pei Feng Yin from Pinterest Lab. So this is a work that we worked on while I was still a PhD student at Penn State University. The topic of the paper is called Economic Worth Aware Word Embedding. So let's start from imagining today looking at a menu, a restaurant menu. You're going to a restaurant and let's assume you are given a menu where your friend is treating you. So in a lot of restaurants, they might have these options where the menus have all of the prices covered. So if you're only looking at the text, are you able to guess the dish's price? given just the text. So throughout our language learning process and then through the life experience, we have built up a lot of senses for this kind of concept where certain words are always associated with expensive prices while others might associate with cheaper prices, right? This sounds intuitive. And if we, when we look at it actually from the data perspective, we can actually see that. So as you can see over here, the, the prices that each of these words associate to really um, vary from one to another. Okay? So one example will be whenever we look at egg over here, or just rice, they tend to be lower, lower on the lower prices end. But when you look at salmon or steak, they're associated with higher price, which is very natural. So one of the papers that have tried to attempt such concept of the word price is a paper um, called Word Salad. And they did collect a lot of the menu data. And what they did was to a point they run a linear regression where each of the words are simply associated with a uh, with coefficient in the linear regression model. However, we do believe this is um, oversimplifying the problem itself. So when we try to run the experiment through just simple single layer neural network by playing around with a different number of dimensions in the hidden layer, we do see that as you increase the number of neurons in the hidden layer, the mean square error decreased dramatically whenever you are given uh, the text, texture description of menu dishes and then predicting the price itself. So I will talk into a bit more into this later on. The next concept is a contextual factor. So uh, very intuitively, as you can imagine, not only do we care about what are the texts written on the menus that will associate with the different prices whenever we look at the dishes, but also one important thing is which city that you are currently at, right? So some of the cities, they will associate naturally to higher cost of living, while others will associate with lower cost of living. So if you're on those, you're, you're currently uh, in the dining at the more expensive cities, then naturally you will be paying higher prices and vice versa. So what are we trying to do after identifying this kind of underlying, um, underlying properties that we want to capture for words? What is the objective of this paper and what are the approaches that we took to achieve it? So first of all, for the objectives, we want to learn the word embeddings that capture both the semantic meanings and the word worth, which is the economic worth that we talked about. So you must have seen many, many of the word embedding or re word representation learning models that have successfully captured the semantics with many different kinds of variations, right? But we want to introduce this new idea of word worth and then being able to capture it by a model design. The next thing is we also want to learn the contextual bias. So the biases that are able to capture the impact of the context on the overall worth. So the approaches we took is we designed a neural network model that learned the above two. And also in order to facilitate the model training, we also introduced two types of sampling methods that samples the input data that will help the training and then achieve both of the uh, embedding to be learned. So for us, the, the goal of the learned embedding, they should achieve the, the following two. First of all, they should be interpretable, which we will show later with uh, various visualization. And then more sec uh, um, also specifically, we will love to optimize a uh, very specific uh, evaluation task. And here we use two examples, the prize and missing word predictions. 
All right. We open source the implementation of the model, which is implemented using PyTorch. And also we host the implementation as well as the data sets on our GitHub repository, which I will show the link at the very end of this presentation. All right, so let's start from the model design. So a bit of the model overview. So this model itself does contain three components. Then we have, um, the first of all, the uh, missing word prediction component, which is over here on the bottom left of the architecture. And we also have a price prediction component, which is over here, uh, the top right corner of this model. And then the next part is the contextual integration, which is on the right, uh, upper right part of this model. So let's go into them one by one. Um, first of all, I will start from the sequence embedding. So it doesn't map to the exact components over here, but let's start from the pink box over here, okay, which we call it the sequence embedding. So the ideal of the sequence embedding is today, imagine you taking in many data and then the textual, textual uh, description of it can be considered as a sequence of words. So let's start from using that as an input and then passing in into the model. So the first stage it goes to is the sequence encoding part. So given a seamless sequence, we will use the embedding metrics here we designed as WE to convert the raw sequence to a sequence of um, a representation mapping to each word. Then the sequence is embedded using a recurring neural network. So here I won't go into much detail of this because it's a very standard way of using recurring neural network. So after this first stage, given a sequence, we're supposed to be able to get an embedding of this whole sequence by passing into a recurring neural network. All right, and the second part, which is the, the part I really like, the very interesting part is the contextual integration. So as I said before, for example, doesn't matter which, uh, doesn't matter what dishes you're looking at, it matters a lot which city that you're currently in. So the city idea is incorporated using this uh, contextual integration. So here we design the contextual bias this concept itself as a tensor rather than just a simple uh, matrix. So what we mean by that is here we introduce a tensor with the shape of L times N times N, where L is the number of unique contextual factors inside of your data set. So again, using the restaurant example, that L can be the number of cities that you currently have inside of your data set. And the N corresponds to previously, the hidden dimension of our sequence embedding. And also the other end actually maps then to the hidden, uh, the dimension of the contextual bias that you desire. So we purposely design the dimension of the sequence embedding and also the contextual bias to be the same. And before I jump into how we do that, uh, let me just quickly talk about the, the reason why we do that. So the reason we decide to make them into the same dimension is for the sake that the idea of, of contextual bias, we really want to make it into a bias rather than another embedding that you have to use different kind of fully connected neural network to combine them. So using a bias, you can directly put them together so here is the contextual bias and here is a sequence embedding. You can directly put them together and do a pairwise addition. And that can, you can almost imagine it as if in a high dimensional space, you directly provided a shift. So because of the shift, then some of the direction will be viewed as moving towards a higher price dimension. And the other way will be moving towards a lower price dimension. So I will show you guys some really cool visualization later that we are able to achieve it. So that's kind of the overview of how we do it. All right, so let's see. And then the, the formula here simply lists down the exact concept that I just walked through. And if you want a more visual taste of how we achieve that, then on the most left-hand side over here, that is the tensor that we talked about that we designed as the, as the part of the contextual integration. And every time after you pass into the model of the context vector, contextual factors that you're currently uh, you, uh, seeing in the input, it's almost like slicing. You, just, you take this tensor and then you slice it. 
and then you slice it based on currently which contextual factor you're looking at, then you, you obtain a slice of n times n matrix. And this n times n, this on the horizontal, time, uh, horizontal direction, that is corresponding to the hidden dimension from the sequence embedding that you got earlier. So after doing a dot product with the hidden dimension you're currently having, then you'll be able to then come down to one, oh, sorry, one times n embedding. And here, that is the contextual bias that we want. Okay, so that is a really cool part that I really like. Uh, all right, so if you look at this model, so now we cover both of these parts. Let's go to the final part of the output of the model. So the output of the model comes in uh, two goals of it. So two objectives we're trying to achieve. The first one is the price predictor and a price prediction. And the second one is word prediction. So simple as that, they're using the, using the embedding we got earlier, we're able to pass it through to the final layer and then get the prediction of either a continuous value as price or a categorical value. Uh, which we will pass into cross entropy of softmax, uh, then then uh, um, that will be for the missing words. Okay, so I will talk about why we mean by missing words later. But um, an additional functionality that I won't go into too much detail later in the evaluation, but it is provided as an option in our model are the switches. So in some data sets, the contextual bias is actually not important at all. So you can switch it off. And for some data set, it is important. So here we introduce two switches. One is the switch between the contextual bias and the price prediction. One is the contextual bias and the word prediction. So it depends on whether you switch it on or off, then the, that can completely control the contribution from the price prediction. Oh, no, 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 from the contextual bias. All right, so the model training itself here, very simply, we designed two objectives. So this model itself is joint task. Um, one objective is to optimize the, the, the word prediction and the other, the, uh, the word prediction one we call the semantic objective. And the other one is optimizing the price prediction, which is the economic worth objective. So in order to facilitate the training, we actually purposely designed two input sampling methods. One is the whole sequence input sampling and the other one is subsequence input sampling. So whenever we uh, enable the whole sequence uh, input sampling, then the model itself actually only goes to the route of the price prediction. Because as you, as you can imagine, if given an input and you take the whole sequence of it, then, then it's completely pointless for us to try to guess what's the missing word because there's no word missing at all, right? And on the other hand, if we trigger the subsequence sampling, then it doesn't make so much sense for us to guess the price because the information is incomplete. However, if we are only looking at the subsequence, it makes a lot of sense for us to guess what are the other words that are not covered by the subsequence. Okay, so when we are doing the training per epoch, we actually only look at one of these sampling methods and it's interchangeable between the epochs. So we design a biased coin with probability alpha. Every time when we enter an epoch, we toss the coin and alpha maps to the probability of triggering whole sequence input sampling, which is the price prediction objective. So uh, through this process, one can also tune the alpha and then try to say which of the objective does your data set care about more? All right. So evaluation. Uh, for this whole work worth model, our evaluations are actually in, experimented on four different kinds of data sets. Uh, so you can see on the table on the bottom left corner. So the data sets are the menu data set, shoe data set, retail data set, and reward data sets, which we all put it on the GitHub repository as well. So these data sets are all coming with the nature that a text with description of either a menu, a dish on the menu, or a, an actual product that you can purchase, or a, a reward package instead of a crowdfunding project. 
so on and so forth. Um, so these are like the textual description mapping to economic worth, which is like price. So that's why we, we use these um, to do experiments. So all of these models that we implement using PyTorch, uh, which you can find for Market Hub repository. And for the purpose of the experiment, we set the hidden dimension for both the word embeddings and the contextual biases to be 128. And also the, the results that we demonstrate over here, both the alpha and the beta, um, which I didn't have time to go through, which is uh, the beta idea, but it's basically associated with the subsequent sampling. Uh, which you can refer to more in the paper. But for us, both the alpha and beta are set to 0.5. And the batch size here, we use 256. Okay, so um, I won't cover too much about the baselines, but um, they are pretty straightforward, fully connected neural network that a consider different, different aspects of the data set. But here, I'll just put them here. And I want to show you the power of or learned embedding. All right, so, so the first thing we want to look at is whether our learned embedding associates well with price. So the first way we look at it is here, I show you both the, uh, the results from the menu data set and the shoe data set. So in the menu data set, uh, what we did is we purposely get the learned embedding of the word lobster. And for each of the different kind of methods we are testing, we take the embeddings of lobster and find the top 10 other words that are the nearest to it. So for KN, we set the K to 10. We find the top 10 um, nearest words based on the embeddings learned by this specific given model. And we plot the box plot over here, which is uh, the, all of the prices the word is associated to. So as you can see, the very cool thing is, as you move for from the most left to the right hand side, uh, that is the more complicated the model gets and the most right hand side is our word worth model. You can see the distribution of the price each, asso each word associate with gets closer and closer so it gets like more neat, neater and neater as you go towards a work worth model same thing applies when you look at um, the shoe data set also but the second thing is we also look at it from directly projecting it to a two-dimensional space through tisney and then see how the words kind of scatter around in the high dimensional space so we also, again, compare to word to vec. Uh, so our learned embedding, what we did is, oh, one important thing I forgot to mention in the last one. This one, um, in order to find the, the KN, using KN to find the nearest words um, fast, what we did is we built a KD tree, a spatial tree, so that can help out um, the efficiency when we find it the nearest neighbors. Here, what we did is, what we did is for each of the methods that we learned the whole sets of the embeddings associated with the words, and we passing all of these embeddings into TISNI, and then we um, we visualize the same sets of words um, using different models that that learn the embeddings, and we put the the associated um, average price next to it. So as you can see, on the left-hand side is the embeddings learned by word to vec, and then on the right-hand side is the embeddings learned by word worth model. So very interestingly, as you can see, um, let's start from the word worth model. Very interestingly, as you can see on the most right-hand side, it's champagne, right? So champagne associated with high price. Champagne, this word itself, on average, the price of the dishes are 62.13, which is expensive. But as you can see, when you move more toward the upper left in this plot, you can see that the prices decrease. It gets lower and lower. So, right, when you look at butter, it is only 7.24 US dollars. These are all in US dollars, right? But when you go down more to like the bottom right direction, you can see the expensive item, which is caviar, right? So, uh, then that shows up there. 39.73 US dollars. So it's almost like in this direction, 
Okay. Next thing I want to talk about is the is the um, contextual bias effect on the words. So here, uh, what we did is we picked four uh, sample words or example words from the data set, and then we apply different kind of contextual bias on them to see the effect. So let's start from the menu data set where we experiment with the lobster uh, example again. So as you all know, lobster is one of the famous dishes that Boston can offer. So we want to see how the contextual bias of Boston when it's conditioned based on lobster will affect the word itself compared to what the other cities will affect it. Will affect it. So very interestingly, you can see um, on average lobster itself, it's over here, it's just $19.31, right? But when you add it to the contextual bias of Boston, immediately the price goes whoo, to a lot smaller, which is only $6.95. Uh, and then for New York, uh, yeah, New York is close to close to water as well, but, but it's not as known for a lobster as Boston. But you can see it also has like a lower price than average, right? A little bit more expensive than Boston, but yeah, it's over there. <laughs> the same thing when you apply to Chicago, you can see because Chicago is a lot further away from water compared to Boston and New York. So you can see over here, then it has a complete different effect and it's way closer to the original 19.33 dollars the lobster on its own would have right it's 14 dollars over here so very interestingly you can see the effects over here all right so that's enough about the qualitative part and um because of time i won't show you uh the price prediction but feel free to refer to the paper but i just want to talk very quickly on the word prediction uh, task that we are able to achieve well with word worth uh, model. So as you can see, uh, our models are able to achieve really good precision and recall on most of the data sets beside the shoe data set. So you can see over here for um, the many data set, word worth has a way higher precision than all of the rest. Same thing in the retail, reword, and also in recall. However, we are not able to to do uh, achieve such a good performance inside of the shoe data set and when we go back to dig out the potential reason why we figure it is because compared to other data sets shoes contextual bias effect is too too significant on it so compared to the cost of living of the city that might affect the final prices on the menu dishes the brands of shoes actually have a way higher um, impact on it so hence the results. But overall, with just embeddings and very simple way of trying to find what are the relevant words without using any other advanced machine learning models, our, our embeddings are uh, able to help such kind of prediction task. All right, so conclusion for this work, we identify the importance of understanding the economic worth of words and propose a neural network joint task uh, word worth model. And through the comprehensive evaluation on four real-world data sets, we show the quality of the learned word embeddings and contextual bias. Uh, sorry for the typo over there. And in the future, we plan to explore more potential architecture design of the word worth models. So thank you all very much. I just here want to give a couple of acknowledgments. So this work is supported by the National Science Foundation under our grant number 1717084. Um, and the implementation and data sets of this work can be found at the following link below, uh, which is hosted on the GitHub repository. So feel free to contact me if you have any question. My email is down below and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much.